Thanks for joining us um, today um, with Davion, who I've known for you know quite a long time, and we've like talked about his voter practice and sort of the growth of his voter practice over the years that we've been in dialogue. Um, I'm sort of really interested in this new work, um, as I wrote in that essay for Aperture Magazine, um, because in some ways um, it represents a departure in Davion's practice. Um, and I wanted to sort of kick off by sort of getting an understanding of how you've sort of come upon this work um, and why you sort of made this particular series in this moment. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much, Antoine and Claire. Um, yeah, so a lot of the work that I've been making recently came out of this larger scope and desire to gather while also obstructing or obscuring identity within the participation of this work for the safety of the participants um, during a surveillance kind of state that we're in. It made me really think about not necessarily like just the environment itself and how politicized things are, but like how do we see past just what's in front of us? How do we make something vivid? How do we make something utopic out of this chaos? So a lot of the work now that I make has more of a tactile approach. It's not just sterile photography. There's a lot of me adding in uh, pie stickers, a lot of sewing, a lot of different uh, patterns. And I find other kind of disciplines to help foster the practice of photography to also challenge the future of photography because it is very interesting with with what happened all last year and how photography played its role in it. So very and, how, and sort of to pause there for a second, you said it's really interesting about what happened last year and how mm -hmm. the role that photography played, can you talk about sort of the events that led to um, this particular project and um, the role that you saw photography play um, in sort of the shaping, but also unfolding of the events mm -hmm. of last year? Um, so a lot of what came from last year was a cascade of events. So here in Atlanta, there's the moment of the pandemic, the health crisis that we all had to deal with on a global scale. Um, and then because of so many co like consistent deaths, uh, there became an insurmountable amount of protests. Uh, Atlanta being one of the ones that held a lot of protests because Atlanta didn't really shut down as a city. It really stayed open throughout the protest, throughout the pandemic. As soon as everything became serious, Atlanta didn't close. So it kept this kind of like stress of movement and action going. Mm -hmm. And the work essentially like did what it needed to do. I didn't, I always try to be forward with this kind of documentation because I don't subject myself as activist. I don't subject myself as journalist. Um, I really do stick by being a visual artist and there was something about the ethics of photography, how it was being over diluted with the photo basedness of all these photos, like just like having all these photos just accumulate on Instagram, on the internet, mm -hmm. and it's distorting its view on what's actually happening. So for me, it was about how can I use my photographs in a way that stays moral to the point, mm -hmm. but then also stick true to me being a visual artist. Mm -hmm. I was not interested in like the protest photos like at all, just as bare photos, even though I felt responsible as a photographer or a lens-based artist to go out and get these photos. Why, why didn't you feel, for you, what, are, what is the limitation of say, a sort of gun and you know a run and gun sort of style sort of you know shoot sort of documentary image um in sort of a case that might sort of depict a protest so like what is the limitation of a protest image and how did you seek to sort of complicate those limitations in sort of the images that you took in Atlanta um that was you know situated or cited in sort of some of the the uh, actions that 
um, came out of um, the sort of killing of you know um, black folks at the hand of law for law enforcement, particularly in Georgia, um, yeah. and sort of the other racial violence that happened there with um, with Ahmaud Arbery, um, mm -hmm. which was not law enforcement, right? And so mm -hmm. there, there's, sort of, there's these sort of things that are happening sort of in the span of weeks of each other that sort of right. you have the city um, coming together collectively to express anger, to sort of shut down sort of normal life. Um, and I was wondering sort of how did you sort of grapple with that? Because I think that, you know, on one hand, when you think about the protest photograph, like there's there's inherent sort of issues which you get it in the photos where it's like there's things around surveillance, around sort of, you know, now if photos are posted on social media, um, there's some uh, there's some questions around policing. There's questions around sort mm -hmm. of cop using, you know, those images to sort of aid in sort of investigations and things like that. And so how did you, for you, what's the limitation of a protest image? And how do, are you sort of circle, uh, how are you sort of, uh, you know, reanimating that image mm -hmm. in this particular project? Maybe, maybe we want to also bring up some images sort of we can just yeah. sort of show it with viewers. Yeah, let me see. And then I'll answer your question. Yeah. So let me cut on the. Um, so situate yeah. us, where are we? So in this first photo, this is pretty much one of the main ones, I believe that's a part of the Belfast Photo Festival. Uh, it's a part of the series stepping on the ant bed and in this particular moment, this is where protesters were going on to highway 8575 south. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I believe, six lanes of traffic that this whole group of protesters decided to stop to bring like a lot of alarm and alert to what's going on. And this is also near where Rayshard Brooks was killed at mm -hmm. the Wendy's. So. Mm -hmm. The goal here is again like obstructing the audience or the viewers look at certain identities, covering them to protect those participants within it, mm -hmm. while also highlighting, let's say, the signs or symbols around the subject matters. So for me, I'm not interested in like, I got to get that quick shot, I got to get people's face in the police face. I wasn't interested in that because there's already such a, um, a diluted source of those kind of photos mm -hmm. or very fast photos. And I find those to be very, um, it's taking a 60th of a time when this time has been so long over this mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, is that, so for is me, that why, is that why you chose not to cut you off, but is that why you chose sort of almost these landscapes opposed to sort of the, opposed to sort of thinking about portraits or portraiture, what you're sort of capturing or how I sort of understand these photos and, and looking at them is sort of a real sort of um, survey of a landscape, right? Mm -hmm. And that could be sort of like, you know, this sort of landscape as it is on the side of a, of a highway, but also the landscape of surveillance, the landscape of racial justice, this landscape of history is also sort of being sort of collapsed into these images where, you know, you're what I, I love what you said about um, this idea of like, when you think about portraits, you're really thinking about sort of a cropped sort of moment, right? And you're thinking mm -hmm. about sort of one individual. And, you know, I think one of the things that sort of is interesting about these works and what they allude to is that, you know, it really is about a history and being sort of situated in a history and sort of be situated in a landscape or a lineage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I definitely like will say off of that, yes. Mm -hmm. I am interested in the idea of more of a landscape because we got to remember th this work was made out of distance and longing. So it's like, mm -hmm. I'm longing to be outside of just my individual self. I'm longing mm -hmm. to be more with a collective of people. Mm -hmm. And instead of this being perceived as like, yes, this is a part of Black Lives Matter moment, but instead of it being just perceived as that, this is one collective group of people defining freedom off of just the basis of one person being killed. And I think that right there in itself speaks to 
and against and challenges the individual freedom that Americans sort of have. I think there's something here that because of the pressure of it, it allowed for everybody to sort of see past um, what makes us sort of different. Mm -hmm. Then also using that kind of I idea, again, to help keep an umbrella of misidentification over these people. Mm -hmm. But I definitely like, I saw more work to be done with larger groups of people because it made things like, it made things more outside of myself. It made things more telescopic. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, you know, in the essay, the, the Aperture essay and the Utopia issue, I was really sort of particularly struck by something that you said. And so I'm gonna read this quote, if that's okay. Um, yeah. I am able to think about the protection of identity due to surveillance and speculation, as well as redefining what the landscape looks like mm -hmm. in 2020, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that like, again, like you go on to say, you know, um, it, it was a way for you to sort of think about desiring utopia and dystopia. And I, I, I that has be even beyond sort of this sort of conversation. We had that conversation, you know, very sort of, this is now maybe what, six months ago or something. I have like, yeah. I Sort of that you know, desiring utopia within dystopia that has stuck with me and has almost sort of like played you know, sort of in my mind as I've been thinking about um, the ways in which like we have to navigate spaces, right? And yeah, even yeah. In sort of uh, unfortunate, you know, circumstances or in situations of uh, dystopia, um, there is still an impulse for a utopic vision, right? And so even mm -hmm. in your images here, you see this sort of collective action on behalf mm -hmm. of sort of a better sort of, you know, tomorrow, if you will, or on behalf of um, sort of putting in sort of mechanisms to sort of stop tragedy, right? On behalf mm -hmm. of you. And so I was, I was wondering if you could sort of talk about sort of the, what you in this moment, um, as an artist in this moment out there, a part of the collective, what you experienced and how that that sort of informed the images that we are sort of seeing. Mm, so talk about my own personal experience. Uh, went out and I went out on that like intuitive thought of like, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Is this that important to go out and risk the idea of exposure? Right. Uh, and how serious can I take that when the world is at its height of it versus Atlanta being just living in it, like casually things be open. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there was some form of moment where it's like, there's anger that came because like, why are all these people out here doing all these things? And it's because Atlanta is forced to be out here to do these things. But then to look around, I'm like, yo, there's everyone really critically out here pushing for something and they're not like just out here just to be seen even though there is of course like everyone is recording everyone is taking photos it's more so this idea that like they have to push together so mm -hmm. I have like I didn't add any of the clips um, but there's clips where I took where they're all running up the hill and mm -hmm. I'm hearing somebody in the megaphone saying very explicitly, if you are not Black, if you are not an ally, if you are not trans, you need to get up on this hill and you need to get to the front of the lines. And so like, there was this moment where things became real organized and real militant that I was very happy about. And there was moments where I, my eyes watered because it's like, I'd never seen, like in 2016, when Trayvon Martin was killed, like there were, there were things that were in place mm -hmm. that happened here in Atlanta but it wasn't to the height of what it was recently. So mm -hmm. like seeing that, seeing the growth or seeing that wave of seriousness happen between the years mm -hmm. gave me a lot of hope for the city. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure I did that for a handful of people because it was something that was like, if you were there to see it in person, you, you, you only see these kind of things in the news. So it's like, how am I a part of this moment that is now being a part of the head of this news like coming to all those terms at once while mm -hmm. also like not trying to overstep or not trying to um 
do too much? How do I stay as true to this moment without mm-hmm. manipulating or distorting it as mm-hmm. in another kind of narrative? Mm-hmm. Um, so it, for oh. me, it was all- hmm? No, no, go ahead, go ahead, please, please. For me, for me, it was just all about physically and through like the camera protection. Mm-hmm. So how do I censor and how do I protect people while also, and I don't want to use like, I, archive is an overused term, like, but how do I build work that does not look like from this year from to 2015 to 2016? Mm-hmm. And how does that thing look new while also adhering to the responsibility of being a photographer in this space? Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that's sort of interesting, I think, is the care that you take to sort of protect uh, folks identity um, mm. in a moment when they, you know, in a moment where they want to be seen, right? A protest mm-hmm. about sort of taking space, about holding that space, about sort of, uh, you know, sort of sharing your demands um, in a public space, um, speaking truth to power. and. I was wondering how you were sort of grappling with that in this particular series where um, this is the, you know, this is sort of one of those, er- you know, areas of photography where folks um, uses their identity um, in a way that, sh- that is a challenge to um, the status quo. And so I was wondering, were you thinking about that uh, in your photograph and, you know, the sort of contradictions of, of that. Yeah. Um, I'm very interested in like the role of the camera and how Mm -hmm. subject matter perform for the camera. Mm -hmm. So Atlanta being one of the, it's, it's right now deemed as like black Hollywood solely because Mm -hmm. So many films are done here. Reality TV shows are done here. It's, it's a big stage set. I, I call Atlanta a, set, a, set, a film set. Solely because there's this constant performance to be pushed and projected outward to others. And I find that to be the reproduction, the circulation of imagery, I feel like dilutes and oversaturates at the same time the actual message or manipulates the actual moment in time. And I think there's something there where I believe there's a respectability that needs to happen. Is this entertainment or is this elevation? Mm -hmm. And how do I constantly grapple with the fact of, am I trying to entertain through performance? Mm -hmm. Or like, what is the point of my photograph? Because we've diluted the sense of a photograph to Instagram and like, what does that look like? The futurity of photography challenging these moments. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like, I just like, I'll read this about, I believe it's very important to think about the role and power of photography specifically in this moment because of the reproduction and circulation of imagery that can be manipulated and diluted during this time where truth matters the most. It shouldn't be oversaturated with this micro cycle of performance. Question the photograph, question the information that comes from the photograph. Mm -hmm. How How do we obstruct getting answers by not giving them what's actually in the photograph? Mm-hmm. So really thinking about the responsibility to the community and the environment while still trying to adhere to the right message without it being performative. Mm-hmm. I'm very like critical on the truth and photography is the power of truth and how we define what truth is. Mm-hmm. And I think this challenges that, like the dots challenge like, oh, so-and-so said that they saw you here. So-and-so probably did, but this photograph is the thing that holds truth. But if you can't see me, is that, is, did a tree fall in the woods and make a noise? Right. So um, constantly thinking about things like that uh, has always been a role in my work. Even like when I shoot still lives, they're mm-hmm. used in stand-in for Black identity. Um, and it's just constantly been a re like a reprodu- reprodu- reproducible moment. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, do you want to show a few others? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to sort of also turn our attention to two things. One, we'll be taking uh, questions for Davion um, in a, in about fifteen minutes. So, if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat, and I'll happily read them. Um, yeah. And you know. Because you know this work is being shown in public, 
right, at Belfast Photo Festival, you know, on the side of <clears throat> homes and sort of in sort of this way that it's sort of interesting because you have a public action being shown in public in this way. And I was wondering how for you does um, the sort of mounting of these photos in public um, affect sort of the way in which they are perceived or change your relationship to them or change the relationship to the way that you were thinking about them? Because I, I imagine you were probably not thinking about sort of billboards when you were you know, making this work. And so I was wondering if you could sort of talk about sort of the context of their presentation. <laughs> yes. Well, isn't it like the irony? I'm trying to protect all these people, but then it's like blown up to the scale. Um, yeah. I genuinely, it, it's putting importance on a pedestal. It's putting the importance on this and stressing that this needs to be a grand door scale. Like, so to see it on a billboard versus on the screen of my phone mm -hmm. feels more effective mm -hmm. solely because because of this pandemic i'm not looking for just a digital presence but those who can encounter it physically so to be asked to do it on that kind of large scale sort of helps me understand like this work does need to stand at this kind of size mm -hmm. it does need to be speculated upon but it also doesn't have to show all of what needs to be shown because that is the importance of like this whole work um i definitely believe in like the role of it being larger like mm -hmm. what does that do like the, the billboard being one-to-one -one size to a person maybe like how mm -hmm. does that change and affect our view to things and how we can sit and take it in. Because if it was just on my phone, I would scroll by or I would like, oh, okay. But to print certain things, especially at that large, it gives me a moment to put importance on this, mm -hmm. see it from a distance while also enjoy the fact that it's being physically viewed. Mm -hmm. And so I do enjoy like that kind of like scale. I love that it did go up. Um, I did also have, one printed here in the United States for mm -hmm. an exhibition at that, like at a large scale as well. And it, the turnout was really nice. I, I respect the work way more. Like it made me come back to the work by and just reprinting it and doing it. For you to sort of have that experience of, ex, uh, of exhibiting it in the United States, uh, what were some of the reactions and, and has, how has that sort of uh, furthered the conversation around these images? It interesting. Um, it was it's very interesting. Like right now, yesterday, uh, someone came into the museum. I have the work right now at the Museum of Contemporary Art of Georgia. Someone mm -hmm. came up, and again, for me, I don't see. I do see, of course, what this is as a racial tension. But mm -hmm. someone specifically pointed out, like, oh, did you just cover up like all the black people's faces and just kept all the white people exposed? I was like. No, that was never my intention to see that. So it's like, there's people can encode something into it. People can see what they see for it. Mm -hmm. But I've learned that so many people are looking at different things. Mm -hmm. So like there's some images I have where it's so ambiguous because there isn't any signs, there isn't anybody's face. All you can see is the environment with all these colorful stickers mm -hmm. versus others, there's signs and symbols for people to look at. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's like, oh, okay, the importance is having the subject matter in the photo while also paying attention to just the spatial arrangements around them. How, so. how um, can you talk about the process for sort of the mark making, like the actual using the stickers and how was it an organic sort of process? Was it a process mm -hmm. that were you sort of, did you have um, sort of some rules? Did you provide yourself with rules? Or did you, how did you sort of come about um, sort of putting the marks where, um, where you ended up, where they ended up being in the, the body of work? Um, yeah, uh, so I can talk about the process. For some reason, I, and this is why I say I'm a visual artist, because 
I always get confused on the translation from like digital to printing something and resolution and stuff. But it was a bunch of back and forth getting these billboards together. Um, but during the process, I remember taking the photos and I was sitting with them in my apartment and I would just stare at them. I had like a bunch of them on my wall. And unbeknownst to me, and still like with homage, I wasn't aware that John Baldessari passed away. Mm -hmm. So like, so recently to the thing. Mm -hmm. So I just remember when I was an undergrad, I took a nude of myself for an mm -hmm. exhibition mm -hmm. and they told me very impromptu that they didn't want my genitalia to show. So it's like, I remember putting a bunch of like peach stickers over it. And uh -huh. there was something about the idea of using stickers and adhesive on top of the photo, which made me not just negotiate the photo as something serious, but the obstruction mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that same thing came to me. I was like, looking, I was like, yo, I love primary colors, mm -hmm. price stickers. So mm -hmm. I went to the nearest office depot, bought different uh, regular size price stickers and some small ones. And then eventually I ended up buying large hole punchers that like mm -hmm. does various size large uh, hole punches. And I started to do that. Um, and there was something, again, I could have easily added colored circles through Photoshop, through a clone stamp. Right. But I chose to print out the photos and then apply something on top of it. And that's where things start to become more tactile for me in the work. I was like, oh, I actually like touching my photographs now. Mm -hmm. So there was no real strategy to where I placed them. I just know I wanted them composed and thoughtfully spaced out, mm -hmm. not looking too crowded. But in some places, if there's clusters of people, they can look crowded. But it wasn't a, an intentional like, this needs to go here exactly two inches away from this one, and it needs to go mm -hmm. over this specific face. Um, mm -hmm. It was just like, yeah. And then for the larger one, and for the one I think, for one of the ones in Belfast, I had to digitally add the stickers. Like once I started to enjoy the process of putting them on, mm -hmm. I, I tried scanning in the photos, but of mm -hmm. course I need I need the raw file to be able to expand. Uh, yeah, for scale oh. and resolution and things of that nature, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then that's when I started for the larger ones, put uh, clone stamp dots and just mm -hmm. kept placing them all over people's faces. And so that became like a good tedious process for me or mm -hmm. laborious process. Um, but thoroughly enjoy really physically obstructing photos. I also started to collage a lot of things mm -hmm. in like through this time as well. So challenging and obstructing the photo through these more uh, hands-on, more uh, like the South is known to be like self-taught in these like niche folk art ways. So it's like mm -hmm. finding that kind of like smoothness in there. And so, yeah. It's like what, it was a nice process. You you mentioned collage, and so mm -hmm. like you are you inter are you are you interacting with a history of collage? Are you thinking about collage um, in this particular work? N not in this particular work. Mm -hmm. The dots can yes be collage, but I have like multiple bodies of work that I've been mm -hmm. working on through the past year and again, the work came out of this desire to be around people. So what I would do through a lot of my photos was I would collapse the sense of time and interweave them in multiple different ways to look mm -hmm. like different fragments at windows, look, um, cutting out certain friends from one moment, putting them in another moment, allowing the narrative to sort of change, allowing the memories to sort of change to the photo, um, mm -hmm. while also just allowing a new um, out of this desire of not being able to constantly gather with my friends. Mm -hmm. And so it is an evolved form from like what I was doing for this particular work, but there is a lot of sense of collage that it has started to introduce itself. Um, I would like for us to sort of, yeah, go through a few more of your images and maybe if we I'll ask, uh, there's another question I have, but maybe as as I, as I you answer it, maybe we can go through to just give a better sense of the the overall sort of project. Um, you talked almost about 
erasure, right? Mm -hmm. And when I, I think about sort of this body of work and sort of the use of the sticker and that gesture, I think about sort of like protection and erasure, right? And so mm -hmm. you sort of your sort of your ge your gesture is one of protection, but it also sort of removes an identity, right? Mm -hmm. And but I also mm -hmm. think about that in terms of like folks having to sort of fight, so like their pain and their loss and the sort of the person isn't erased, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there's this like sort of dual sort of um, sort of act of erasure that happens in the sort of photo or alludes to sort of these these moments of erasure um, mm -hmm. and memory, you know, and remembering things like that. And so I was wondering, were you, were you at all considering sort of erasure and your own actions, but also how that sort of plays into sort of the, the protesting and the, you know, trying to sort of make your, um, you know, mark a space so folks are remembered, so uh, acts yeah. of violence are remembered, so that, um, you know, this isn't repeated over and over again, um, although, you know, it is ongoing. Yeah, well, that's the thing is like, how do we contend with this constant cycle? Um, mm -hmm. And the idea of erasure, erasure can allow one protection, but then deny representation. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that mean in these stakes? Like what does it essentially mean to erase someone when there needs to be representation, but when the theme of the stuff is the same from just half a decade ago? Um, finding new ways to really think about not just looking at the people that's participating, Mm -hmm. but solely, like you said, the landscape, the environment, the signs and the symbols within spaces and thinking about that. Like I was very intrigued about, and I, hopefully this goes on to the question, but I was very intrigued with certain protests that gave imagery um, of Martin Luther King, of Malcolm X, and it, feeds the, the theme, it feeds this idea of memory passing, but what are we doing when we use the symbol of someone passing? Why not use somebody that's alive like Angela Davis, um, Johnson Davis, but like things like that. Mm -hmm. I was very interested in like making sure if we do have people that are going to be erased, they're people that are, that are, wanting to be erased that want to be like left alone or left there like mm -hmm. for me it was nothing about i just don't like having like people's faces shown and things or i don't like the idea of having participants shown because you never know where that photo circulates to or like how it's being represented but erasure is definitely like a thing where i would put erasure with censorship or maybe mm -hmm. parallel to that um where it's like i'm just abiding by the respect and the responsibility of my craft, mm -hmm. if that's what the person that's in the photos are wanting. Yeah, no, I, I think that it, it's just such an interesting, because we read erasure one way, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a deliberateness here, right? Um, yeah. In the, as you sort of are going through the photos, you know, some sort of, some of the photos have this sort of mark making, um, mm -hmm sticker and some of them don't can you talk about sort of the balance and sort of the use and sort of yeah. why some does and why some don't and and how yeah. you sort of negotiated that in the politics of all of that um in this particular series well definitely the ones that do have dots are the ones that are mostly publicly viewed or known um, just to the responsibility of like the people in the photos. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that are a part of this kind of lecture or like this conversation are uh -huh. specifically for these moments. Mm -hmm. Cause I have, I keep photos all the time but it's never my intention to always show everything. Mm -hmm. It's just like, if this is what I can take this is what I can take. And mm -hmm. the balance of it is looking at that erasure as more of an abundance rather than like a reduction or a lapse. 
seeing like, because I'm erasing this person, I'm actually abundantly challenging and giving more information just in that. Like why, like questioning the reasons of why do I need to erase this person and take these people out? And so- I mean, I think the, that, that one of the things that's sort of interesting about this project is that you see a sticker over someone's body or face, you instantly want to know who that person is or what's being left out or what's the context of the left, you know, the, so there, it does have this sort of, it sort of animates the mind in the way or the gaze mm -hmm. in the way that wouldn't, that would probably, it turns the gaze from sort of a passive to an active sort of um, participant in the image, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is sort of, I think, a clever sort of conceptual sort of technique um, that's being deployed in the images. Mm -hmm. Well, it's all about it's all about keeping the viewer like engaged, and mm -hmm. the viewer loves curiosity. It's l like when you're just deciding to cover someone's face. What we ideally recognize, even in theology, if we can't see the prophet, then we don't have anything to really go off of something subjective. Mm -hmm. And for this kind of work, it's sort of that same thing. If you can't see the participant, then all you can really go off of is this color sticker. Mm -hmm. And so thinking like the importance of just like leaving, having just enough for curiosity, but then not at all like, especially in the art space, showing those kind of things. The color sticker pieces are more the ones that are public view. So mm -hmm. definitely uh -huh. like a stick of truth. We're, I'm going to ask another question, and if there's any more, if there are any questions that the audience may have, please feel free um, to put them in a the Q&A box. If not, I'll ask a few more questions, and then we'll oh. uh, we'll wrap up. Um, the other thing that I was sort of really curious about was the use of the black and white. Yeah. In in this particular series, because in past series you sort of employ color. And I was wondering if you could talk about sort of uh, the use of black and white photography for this particular um, series. Was it, a, was it a question of like time and trying to sort of step outside of sort of notions of time or, or what led you to sort of want to shoot um, in black and white? I, um, I love uniform. And mm -hmm. I think this kind of specific moment called for th the tension to be very transparent. This is a black and white situation. Mm -hmm. Adding in sprinkles of little color is what helps it because that's what helps pop the image out. Uh -huh. But there's, of course, with black and white, there are the notions of history, protest photography from different artists. Um, immediately, uh, me and Sheila Prebright had deep conversations about the roles of protest photography and like why do I challenge what this is what what is protest photography um and these are something about black and white it brings everything down to a level playing field like we're only paying attention to just texture facial recognition signs and we're not really paying attention to the distraction of just the landscape as a very just normal color set um but I definitely like loved and needed to use black and white to give myself more focus. Like even as I went through the photos, I was like, no, these definitely will work better in this kind of like color palette. Mm -hmm. And then me applying color physically with my hand is like what it is. No, I mean, I, I totally, um, totally, you know, Love, love your explanation there. You know, I, I just also think that like, you know, when you think about like protest photos, it's like, in sort of the use of the black and white, it's like, I don't know, it sort of scrambles time in a lot of ways, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think it then sort of, you know, makes the images a part of, you know, an unfortunate, you know, lineage, right? Um, mm -hmm. Of protest you know, of sort of um, in the American context. I, I guess my, you know, sort of really sort of maybe next to last question is what does it mean to sort of have these images of a very American event, you know, um, sort of shown in an international context? What does it mean? Um, that's a good question. 
like take it or leave it, but the work is out there. Uh, I definitely am interested in how America perceives America versus how the world perceives America because mm -hmm. of the information we're fed, what we're taught, uh, what circulates throughout country to country, even like through media being privately owned, I question where a lot of this information comes from. And I find a sense of these photos to be more radically driven outside of here versus than here, because at least they're being with, like they're being held up, they're being paid attention to. Mm -hmm. not saying that they aren't here it's just that there's more critical questions and discussions to photography that sort of came out of many different pockets of the world mm -hmm. that i would not have recognized specifically here in the united states mm -hmm. and there's so a, mm -hmm. there's a question a, from tracy pattison um hi who do you take inspiration from oh um so many different artists again not really a documentarian more like visual artist so i'm very interested in like creating art like real big pieces of work i'm very interested in like Radcliffe daily paul stephen benjamin unique norman renee cox latoya ruby frazier leslie hewitt who else i have like a whole like rolodex of people i love Taryn Simons, Lorna Simpson. <laughs> Do you you have um you have this uh, this sort of grid photo up, and I wanted to ask about the use of the grid for you, and why sort of is this presentation and the use of the grid important um, for the series, but in your practice because it's something you sort of return to. Mm -hmm. um, it's like this is the one example that's at the museum here in Atlanta, mm -hmm. but I'm interested not just in the grid itself, but like how those negative spaces mm -hmm. can portray the look of a window, peeking mm -hmm. into a window, um, mm -hmm. or at a lot of times I have more photos up in the museum and it's just one image spread over or pieces of paper. And so mm -hmm. I'm interested in like the indexicality of like that cross, that, ne mm -hmm. that negative space that makes a cross. Mm -hmm. And then the conversations that lead or peer into like reframing memory through this window. What does this relate to in religion? Like how does this also intersect into a critical conversation here? Um, mm -hmm. But the grid is definitely, I've been playing with it a lot because it's yeah. helping me, it's helping me fragment those memories um, it's helping me be more selective with what I want to show, while it's also letting me piece things together like a puzzle. Like I get to move the pieces around and see like how I want it situated. If I want it to be a continuous image or if I want it to be something broken up into multiple different pieces that doesn't look legible. Um, yeah. And my, my really sort of the last question to wrap us up today is a question I like to ask photographers uh, across sort of medium and sort of how, you know, uh, sorry, not medium, sorry, across genres. Um, why did you pick up a camera? Oh my gosh, that's such a like specific, um, but also like completely related to my practice. Uh, a lot of my work outside of this is extremely self explorative um, and it pertains to the displacement of my identity through adoption. When I was younger, my biological mother told me that she had a photo of my biological father in his military uniform and I was always driven by the idea of knowing what this photo looked like when I was younger all the way up till 18. When I finally met my mom, she said she didn't have the photo of course, there's that kind of like residual effect of that. But it's this desire to tap into a memory that's not there because of this photo not being there, this physical photo. And I think that's what always has kept me grounded in the sense of photography and the power that it does have. How mm -hmm. do we not only challenge what photography is, but how do we accept this thing, this tool, this discipline 
to be something that can really unlock the past to then gain us a better future. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've always been interested in that. I've always just been interested in how uh, filming and the camera is used to employ different modes of knowledge, how it's used in media, how it's used in pop culture. I'm very interested in the, 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 the trajectory or the acceleration that happens after a photo is put into the world, how it moves. Mm -hmm. um, because we as people, like we constantly move and me relating this constant movement to displacement helps me understand the Southeast region as it relates to the Atlantic slave trade, as it relates to my adoption, but then mm -hmm. also just these critical things as us as humans that we just desire to know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I got into photography. I love it. I'm still in photo. I'm not as photo photo. I do a lot of, um, a lot of cutting, a lot of printing, a lot of cropping, but still photo photo. <laughs> And I know I said that was the last question, but indulge us okay. in one more. Um, I will indulge. Uh, maybe we can combine them. Uh, what's next is one of them. <laughs> um, and then the other is, can a deeper, can a deeper concern for the subjects of photographs make a better future for photography? So what's next? It's the first question. What's, yes. Okay. What's next? Um, I am moving extremely fast in my career right now. Uh, I have not really, it's, it is public, but I am starting at Yale for my master's in photography um, this fall. I currently, on top of this Belfast uh, work, I have my first solo museum exhibition for this mm -hmm. fellowship that I just completed here in Atlanta. It's called oh, The Working... The Museum of Contemporary Art of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And so I have a whole separate uh, body of work that's inspired, of course, by this work, but there's more to it, mm -hmm. um, more in depth to my self exploration. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then this, uh, the Belfast stuff. But what's next is school, it's too, like very fertile with ideas. Yale School of Art. Um... Yale School of Art. <laughs> And the last question is, can a deeper concern for the subjects of photographs make a better future for photography? Yes and no, because photography is used in such a um, oversaturated trauma porn kind of way where we've become sort of desensitized to no matter what the subject is, it feels like we quickly run over the thing. But I think with the right thoughts, with the right kind of perceptual ideas around how we protect each other without showing it, I think that is what can help. And I don't know if photography is a part of that conversation fully, but I know in recent years, I've always had a disdain with the role that photography has had in these kind of moments because the accelerated need to reproduce something, to push something out, the narrative that changes over multiple times. I think that photography can be like a double-edged sword. It can be the thing that can create, but also the thing that can kill. Mm -hmm. So, And I just wanted to say congratulations on um, your inclusion in the Belfast Photo Festival. And thanks Thank for you. everyone for joining us for this conversation. Um, and I will talk to you soon. Yes, thank you so much, Antoine, for joining. And thank you, Claire. Thank you, Belfast, for having us. This was such a high honor, very high. So I'm very appreciative.